That can't be right. No way. Stupid scales. No wonder Tina took them out of the bathroom when, when, when she moved in. When we got married, she took those out of the bathroom, and I wondered where they were, and I found them down in the pole barn. Now I know why. Stupid scales. No, they're broke. They're broke. How many of us have ever stood on this? And we said, oh, they're exactly right. Unless, oh, I've lost four pounds. <laughs> During my heart surgery, I was away myself every day, every day, every day for about a month. It got kind of boring. And that situation, you know, and I know it makes some people sick, but the doctor wanted me to at least put a little weight back on. <laughs> and I, 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 definitely, I definitely wanted to do what he said. I did not want to disappoint him at all. And um, I haven't been to the doctor now for two or three months, and I don't know, maybe when I go to the doctor, he'll say, you need to start weighing yourself again, but it needs to go the other direction. I don't know of anybody that really loves weighing themselves. It's just, you know, over at the gym, there is a set right there. As you walk in, and we hit the button, we walk on the set. Those. Then we work out for a half hour or 45 minutes. We walk back over the scales and <laughs> stand back on them again. And we're hoping for a miracle. <laughs> there were two boys, they were at Walmart, and... Um, they were having this conversation um, about the, these bathroom scales that were at Walmart. He said, have you ever seen one of these before? One asked. Hey, my mom and dad have one. The other replied. What's it for? Asked the first boy. I'm not sure. The second boy answered. But I think it stands, when you stand on it, it makes you mad. <laughs> That's pretty much what I think it's for. It makes you mad when you stand on it. We're talking about a new series today that I'm going to be getting, and it's in 1 John, and I'm entitling it Confident Christianity. Confident Christianity. And the very first lesson that we're doing is walk the talk. And as we look at this scripture, and as we look at these scriptures and these short chapters over the next few weeks. I'm going to be teaching this lesson, and I was sharing with some before the service, I think it was Ann Bazaar that was a very, Jan Bazaar, that was a very, very good teacher. She was a good teacher uh, um, in the, um, when, when she was a, a teacher and in, in, in taught, uh, taught grade school, I believe. And now she's a great teacher in teaching um, um, the, the Word of God. Now, she has been, I think, in St. John for two years. And it's okay, right, Sue? <laughs> um, she's going pretty slow. I think they're, they're, they're doing three words a lesson. <laughs> no, I hear nothing but good reports regarding her, her class and, and what she's doing in that ladies' group. And so I chose a smaller book of John. He wrote St. John. He wrote John 1, 2, 3. Then he wrote the book of Revelation. So I, I chose a shorter book than St. John. Um, but we're going to be in here for a few weeks, okay? I'm, I'm not going to say it could, it, could be, it could be several weeks. It will be several weeks that we'll be in, in 1 John. Now, my hesitation on Sunday morning... I'm just going to get, can I get transparent with you? Okay. I mean, cause I know what some of you are thinking anyway, so I'm just going to help you out. That way you won't have to really say it to me. All right. Some of you have, but not many of you. Um, <clears throat> when I stand up here and I preach without notes, I get, I get some people that say, boy, you were really preaching this morning. <clears throat> and then when I stand up here and I, I read my notes, <clears throat> they don't say anything. <laughs> but I know what they're thinking. So my hesitation 
for, for doing this on a Sunday morning is because I'm probably more preachy than teachy. Uh, so I don't want anybody to fall asleep. So if I'm teaching this and I'm reading and I just have just a, an impression that somebody's falling asleep, I just might yell or scream or, or say something really, really funny. And maybe you might wake up. We were walking around the car show over at, over at Bucyrus yesterday evening. And uh, we came around from, from Park Bank and we were heading back toward our car on the south end. And uh, here's all these cars going by. Some, some guys at, at these car shows, they like to drive their cars. There was this one annoying truck, very annoying Dodge truck. And evidently, he didn't think that anybody heard him the first time through. He came through 246 times. And, and, I, and he gassed up and got more fuel and just so he could keep going. Anyway, so we had to leave. and We went to a, to a, a wet wedding reception. Then we came back through and, 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 and we, we caught the eye of, of, of that green truck. And Tina said, there's that annoying truck again. <laughs> But we came around the corner and we were going to head back toward our car. And there was literally a lady sitting there. She wasn't facing the road. She was facing the bank, sitting there in the green grass in a, in a chair. And she was, I mean, she was, I think she was sound asleep. And we were asking, how in the world can she be asleep? How can that happen? And she was just there. And I said, I can change that. I could change that. She said, but, 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 but all these cars and trucks are going by. And she still, she said, how can she be sleeping? So <clears throat> I didn't do it, but I wanted to so bad. So today, since I'm kind of home, I might do it. Okay. I wasn't home yesterday. I was in Bucyrus. So we're going to look at this book and we're going to do some, we're going to do some history. I'm going to give you a little bit of, of um, what the book's about. Back there on the table before you walk out the door, not the high top, Back on the table before you walk out the door is a half sheet of paper, and it just gives um, the, the reason, the background, and, and just three or four paragraphs to the first, the first John. And um, just take those with you, if you would, if you want to go back. I'm, gonna, I'm also going to ask you to read, to read this book. It's not that long, or at least the first chapter. Read it several times this next week, Okay. Now, here's why we're going to do that is because it's going to help me out. Because when we walk in here, you're going to be a little bit more familiar than you would be otherwise. And, um, and John, he repeats himself. Um, and um, he says some of the things here that he said in St. John. Um, and I'm going to repeat myself. And I think the reason we do that, we want to make sure you get it. Okay. John, want to make sure you get it. I want to make sure you get it. And so we're going to do, go through this, through this book and today we're only going to do four verses, not four words. We're going to do four verses. Okay, so we're going to speed things up a little bit. <clears throat> As we look through this, it's a letter that is a general letter. It's not just to one church. It's to, it's to several congregations, okay? And um, it was circulated among the believers in, in the region. And um, he was probably in Ephesus at this time. This is like in the Asia Minor, minor area. And... Um, the tone of this letter is very tender. It's very tender. He uses the word little children. I said, that is a tender word when he's addressing the believers. Little children, I write to you. And uh, he doesn't even say who, who he is at the beginning of it. He doesn't even give his name. But we know it's him because of the way it's written and because when it was written and the language that he uses, it just, he gave himself away completely. He did not have to put his name on that. But then also, because of all that was going on, the false teaching and the heresy and the Gnosticism, all that was, that was going on, he really, really can come, he came down hard on that too. He reminded the believers that they can be certain about the truth of Christianity. And I want you to know that today. We can know the truth about what we believe. We can know the truth about what God's word says to us. And he wanted to emphasize that. And also, we can have the confidence. We can have the confidence that we have a God and a relationship with him that is meaningful, it's awesome, it's precious, it's sacred, it's holy, and it's for our, it's for our welfare. 
So there's two or three different things that he is emphasizing here. But the heresy that is going on, it basically means um, select or chosen. It was these false teachers. It's these false teachers, and they were just doing some truth, and then they were mixing in their thoughts with the truth. And they were just doing this throughout the region and throughout their, their, their teachings. And, and, um, and, and John's not going to, he's, he's going he's to really stand out and, and stand up for the truth through this letter. And um, it also talks about the Gnosticism here. And it's really some that didn't believe that Jesus Christ really died and rose again. And, um, you know, that he was just some just kind of a fictitious person. Um, but they also, Gnosticism means it's all knowledge. It's just knowledge. And how many people do we know today in our world that thinks, if I just have some knowledge, if I had just a little bit of knowledge about God, I, I have time and time again through my ministry, I've talked to people and said, oh man, I tell you what, you, you don't understand. My uncle, he doesn't go to church, but boy, he knows the Bible frontward and backward. And I've heard people say that time and time again. And you know what? The devil loves that. He loves that. He doesn't want us to have a relationship with Christ. And um, if, he, if he wants us to have some knowledge, but we're not going to do anything with the knowledge and we don't have a, a genuine experience with God, that is going to promote what he wants to do or, and, and, and how he wants to condemn us for, for doing what is right. So this was just one of those deals where it's, not, it's, knowledge, it's knowledge that could save you. A spatial knowledge is all it could take. And because of this belief, there are two behaviors that emerge from that. By the way, wrong beliefs always lead to wrong, um, to wrong from the world. Okay? So as we look at these two ways of believing, first of all, the flesh feasting, okay, do whatever you want to do, doesn't matter. And then the flesh fasting. Since the body is evil, any urge that you must purge. And so in view of all of this, people were unplugging themselves from the world. So there, there's this false teaching that was going on. But John doesn't waste any time to get to the main issue and the core issue of the true Christianity that he is promoting. He said true Christianity, it comes only through Jesus Christ. It comes through Jesus Christ. And, and um, there's, a, there's so much confusion today in our world, and there's so many isms and, and people that say, well, a little bit of this is probably okay, but don't do too much. And, uh, and it just the false teachings that are just running rampage in our world today is crazy, and it's, it's just incredible, okay? So the Christianity is not just a system of thought or a philosophy. It's a person. That's true Christianity, and like I told you before, I think I, I, I mentioned this, my, my, my sixth grade teacher, um, she was the one that said, if you just believe that there is a God, you're, you're going to go to heaven. If you just believe that. And there are so many things that has transcended through time. And it's almost like no wonder our world is messed up. No wonder the church gets a bad rap. No wonder there's so many different denominations and there's so many different groups that are meeting together. And so no wonder why so many are not joining the church or coming to be a part of God's family. It's because of all the, all the false teachings and the spirit of our age that is, is, is crazy, okay? So let's read the first four verses and we're going to do that through the points, okay? I'm not going to read the four verses that I'm going to go read them again as we go do the four points. So let's go to your sermon section. And we are week number one, walk the, uh, walk the talk, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The very first thing that this, this uh, book gives to us is that Christianity is fact and not fiction. It's fact and not fiction. And I love, I love John's reading here. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, 
which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim certainly uh, concerning the word of life. As we see this very opening statement here in, very, in the very first verse, we can soon understand that John is in tune. And just look at the things that he had experienced walking with Jesus. I mean, he was the one that Jesus uh, said, take care of your mother when he was at the cross. He was the one that was close. He's the one that, 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 that called John his, his, pretty much his favorite person. And even made Peter kind of mad or whatever. And, you know, Peter just needed to get over it. But uh, John was, John had a, a fabulous understanding and relationship as he was a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the sense also in this message is, is about him that has not, it has not changed anything through the telescope of time. John has been with Jesus now from the beginning of his ministry and the records are true about him. John heard what he said, he saw what he did, and he also touched him. In fact, it's fact, and it's not fiction. Look at this, the, the three or four breakdowns. First of all, he heard. Just think of all the things that John heard from Jesus. I mean, he sat at his feet. He was with him through ministry. All the things that he heard Jesus say over that three-course uh, the, 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 those three years. The things that he saw, he saw with his own eyes the Christ. He looked upon him, and the meaning of Jesus to him was not just something that he imagined, it was something that he witnessed, and it was something that he saw and he understood. He looked at, this goes beyond the scene. It looks at now carefully and deliberately is consideration, not just seeing him, but now he's looking at and he's, can see, he's seeing all the things that are taking place. In John, St. John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, um, And the word became flesh and it dwelt among us and we saw his glory. There's something about experiencing Christ. And I know we did not walk with Jesus in the flesh as John did. But, you know, um, John's conveying to the readers, and it's even to us today, that having a relationship with Jesus Christ is beyond words. It's beyond our imagination. It's something that is just not an ism. It's something that is not just uh, we wrote our name in a book or we said a little prayer. It's something that we're experiencing. Then he said his hands had touched the same word is used by Jesus after his resurrection in Luke chapter 24 and verse 37. Look at my hands and look at my feet. It is me. It's myself. Touch me and see. I'm not a ghost. I have flesh and bones. You have seen me. And this is the person that John is writing about. And he's wanting us today at Light Point to understand this. He's wanting us to understand that we can be certain of our Christianity. Certain. Not just maybe. Not just maybe. I worked with a fellow at Gibson Greeting Card many years ago. And um, he was probably my best friend uh, uh, there at Gibson. And uh, his name was Les. And uh, Les was a little older than I. And uh, he was, he was a, just a great guy. But he was, uh, he was hooked up with the Herbert W. Armstrong and Garner Ted Armstrong. Um, some of you that can go back in your mind, it was the world tomorrow is how they came on the radio. And as, um, and as we, were, um, as we were, were, were talking one day, and, and, and we had a lot of discussion because we disagreed on so many things when it came to living the Christian life. And... Um, uh, Les said, well, you know, he says, um, there's no way that you know you're going to heaven right now. I said, well, sure, Les. I said, I know the Bible. No, he said, he said, you know, you don't really know. He said, the Bible says those that endure until the end shall be saved. He said, how do, how do you know that you're enduring? How, how do you know that? 
And um, it, was, it was one of those conversations that, that we had that he just looked at it in a whole different way than I. Wouldn't it be awful if we had to go all the way through our Christian walk with God? And, 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 and we, 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 we say our prayers, we read our Bible, and, and we, we've done everything that we, we know to do. But yet we're not sure. We're not sure we're going to make it until the end of time. I think we can know now. I know we can know now. I know my Redeemer liveth. And I know that we can have that relationship with Christ. And there is a certain certainty of our Christianity. So um, Christianity is not, it's not fiction, okay? It's, um, it's a fact. Number two, Christianity is proclaimed, it's not private. It's proclaimed, it's not private. In verse number two, the life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Verse 3a. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. So now as we're looking at this man, John, he is, he is really bringing it right to the table, letting us know that he's witnessed it, he understands it, and he wants to make sure that we do, and we're not going to let anybody or anything detour us from our true belief in the one true God. And I believe this. I believe we proclaim. It's proclaimed. It's not private. I really, really do believe this. And you've heard me say it before. My goodness. I'm, but you know what? I'm going to be like John. I'm going to repeat it. Here we are. We're different personalities, different backgrounds, and different makeup. Here we are. I'm glad we're not all the same. Amen? I'm glad you're not all like me. Amen? And I'm glad I'm not like you. Amen. Yeah. Oh, that was good. See? I had to do that because some were getting a little sleepy. I, yeah, you were kind of getting a little sleepy, and I had to kind of help you out there. Okay. I believe this. I believe this. There's something about our walk with God that we need to proclaim it. Now, I'm not saying we're the signs. I'm not saying to carry your, 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 your uh, family Bible under your, under your arm everywhere you go. But I'm saying this. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. So here today, I'm, I'm just declaring this. I believe with all of my heart that we will proclaim Christ if we truly know him. I don't think we need to keep it a secret. I don't think, I don't think it needs to be something that is just, oh, just private, just me and Jesus. It's just me and God. I'm a very private person, and, and, and my Christian walk is very, very private, Pastor Rich. I want you to understand that. And just in case you're wondering, mine is very, very private. Can you explain what very private is? Why is it very private? We proclaim it. We proclaim it. I'm not ashamed to proclaim it. I can give you lots of illustrations today, but I just want you to know, if, if, if we get nothing else, let's understand that true Christianity, okay, is proclaimed. It's not something that's just between us and God and nobody else in private, 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 okay? So as we see these verses of Scripture, it really, it really helps. The word appeared, the word appeared, it appears twice, <laughs> And the meaning of this is to put on display for all to see. You say, come on now. How can we be humble uh, and, and not prideful in doing that? Okay, let's get it right here. We're not ashamed to live out our Christian faith. That's putting it on display. Okay? If you're a, a born-again believer, and let's say you weren't, Two years ago. Let's say you weren't yesterday, but you are today. Let's say every one of us became Christians today. Until, until, until today, we were, all, we were all away from God, and we hadn't repented. We hadn't received Christ as our Lord and Savior, okay? We were not Christ followers. But today, we all became Christ followers. This illustration just hit me. Would somebody write that down? It just came to me. It's not in my notes, okay? <clears throat> and I'm probably not even going to be teaching for a minute. I'm going to be preaching. Here we go. Now we all became believers today. We're Christ followers. We walk out of here 
and we're going to go all the way to our 175 different places. What does tomorrow look like to you? Okay. I'm going to go beyond this. I'm going to get a couple more illustrations. Okay. You got two buddies say, hey, hey, I'm on just news. Frank. Is there a Frank in here? Okay. Hey, hey, Frank. Yeah. Hey, I'll see you down. Uh, hey, I'll see you down at the bar in a little bit. Frank just became a Christian on Sunday. Boy, oh, boy. Oh, 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 oh okay. No, no. Remember when my dad was up here and him and I had that little, maybe, maybe you weren't here. My dad and I had a little bit of a, just a little talk session here one, one time. He sat in a chair and I sat in a chair. And I liked when he gave his testimony. He said, I was a foreman for this big water well company. And he said, when I got saved on a Sunday night, I went back to work on Monday morning. He said, and I called the guys in and said, hey, guys, I want to share something with you. He said, I got saved last night. He said, I don't talk the way I used to talk. I don't tell the jokes I used to tell. And I don't go to places I used to go to. I'm a changed man. Now, we look at that and we say, boy, that, I, uh, that's kind of offensive. But gospel of Christ is offensive. And if we go back on a Monday to our families, to our, to our jobs, to our communities, to our neighbors, and we're no different and we haven't changed, and we're ashamed to, to, to even, even, folks, John says this. He said, we proclaim it. It's proclaimed. It's not private. Boy, I'm going to keep going. Let's go. Let's go on. Number three, Christianity is shared. It's not selfish. You say, well, that's kind of the same thing. No, often we define fellowship as a synonym with food. Don't we? Hey, hey, come on over for some fellowship. We almost always put food with it. And I'm okay with that. But fellowship and food are two different things. If I have fellowship, 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 and no food, I'm going to die. <laughs> if I have food, 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 and no fellowship, I'm, fellowship, I'm going to probably die spiritually. We're talking about the fellowship here. Christianity is shared. It's not selfish, okay? It literally means, here's what the word fellowship, it literally means to have in common or communion. One definition states it this way. The setting aside a private interest and desires to, in order to join with another or others for a common purpose or for common purposes. Okay? So when we have fellowship, I know we put food with it. We don't have to, but we do most of the time. And I'm okay with that. Anybody getting hungry? <laughs> Just 1130. Not quite. I told somebody before I came to the platform, I said, I don't know if, I, if I'm going to be done a quarter after or quarter till. Well, we know it's not going to be a quarter after, so let's keep going. Let's look at these two fellowships, okay? The two fellowship. Did you hear what the Navy called it? Huh? Fellowship is two fellows on the same ship. <laughs> is that right, Terry Poor? There it is right there, okay. Note the two dimensions of fellowship here. Okay, listen to me. This is very important. Huge. There's vertical fellowship. And there's horizontal fellowship. Amen? My horizontal fellowship is not going to be nearly what it needs to be. And neither is yours. Unless our vertical fellowship is right. Okay? Powerful, powerful words of John here. Okay, let's go to number four. Christianity is rejoicing. It's not repressive. 
I'm going to go ahead and say this, and this is to the entire quote, unquote, Christian community. And I know where I'm at this morning. I know I'm in Plymouth, Ohio, but I'm going to say this to the entire Christian community in case I'm on, in case I'm on national TV, okay? Some of us don't exhibit much joy in our Christian life. This scripture says we should be filled with rejoicing. We write this to make our joy complete. Complete. I like joy and I like things that are complete, don't you? Has nothing, nothing to do with each other, but, but the two words... And I'll bring it together some way before quarter tail. And that is this. I like it when I fail and sense the joy of God. When I know, I know I have it and I fail and sense it. And there's time, I just say it out loud. I say, I'm just so happy. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm just full of the joy of God. I'm blessed beyond measure. God's good to me. Even on the bad days, he's a good God. Okay, hold that over here. And I like to complete things, don't you? I had two or three little projects around the house. Had some guys in, they were doing some work, and then, of course, they do their work, then you got to do everything else to put your, everything back to where it belongs. And, and, and I, I had three, three areas, just a mess, out, out in the pole barn. Just, it was just a mess. If you'd have walked in my pole, if you'd have walked in my pole barn one week ago or even four days ago, you would have probably got scared and walked out and say, I can't believe this is my pastor. <laughs> I can't believe he lives this way. But we had to put everything in that one section in order to get the, the other things done. Anyway, but you know what? I worked on one area. God, oh, that, God, that, that is done. So I went over to my house garage. There was a bad concrete pour, so they had to tear everything out. And in order to do that, I had to take the, the, the part of the walls off because the part of the wall was on top, uh, my new wall, the paneling wall, was on top of the concrete. So I had to tear that out of there and take everything out. That's why the pole barn's a mess. But now they're done, and I can drive on my garage floor again. And I went back, and I got, oh, that's done. It's done. I'm complete with that. You put joy and complete together, it's amazing. It's just amazing. Let's just do a little summary here. First of all, let me read Psalm. Write this scripture down, okay? Psalm 16, verse 11. The King James says this. In my presence is fullness of joy. <laughs> In my presence is fullness of joy. The little psalm we used to sing in Bible school, I got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. There's more verses to that in there, huh? Oh, yeah, we know, don't we? Some of us do. Okay. Let's summarize it right here. Confident Christianity according to John here, is this. It's fact. It's not fiction. It's proclaimed, not private. It's shared, not selfish. And it's rejoicing, not repressing. I read this the other day. This pastor, Dave, he said this out of this passage. He had a little three-point outline. Here's what he said. Jesus must be encountered he must be experienced, and he must be expressed. I like that. I almost preached that too, but I, I, I won't do that. So in closing, let me just say this. We were on the scales. We don't like the scales very much. But John talks about some weighty things. The things of God are weighty. They're important. They're serious. 
There can be joyfulness and seriousness all at the same time. These are some weighty, weighty issues that he's talking about here. And I'm sure, I'm sure of this. I'm sure there are some today that you feel weighed down. You feel, you feel oh boy, if I can just get some of this weight off of me. And I'm not talking about your physical, but just the, the weight of worry or the weight of, of stress or the weight of discouragement or the weight of this relationship or whatever. There are things that are weighty in our world today. But you know, the most weighty thing would be this. The most weighty thing for anybody today would be this. If you are here with a weight of sin in your life and you haven't yet received Christ, you haven't asked for forgiveness, you haven't, you haven't embraced the Christian community, you haven't embraced the Word of God, you haven't embraced the fact that you can have a true relationship with Him, that's weighty. And you know what? You can leave here with the weight of sin that's lifted. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? A lot of weighty things in our world today. But the weight of sin is the worst. It's the worst. The weight of sin and guilt. Isn't it awful? When you feel guilty and dirty and, ah. We don't have to live that way. We can be set free by the grace of God.